Hello, welcome back to Algebra 1 with Miss Betsy. Today we are continuing our discussion of solving equations by discussing some strategies for attacking word problems. And I think probably if you talk about word problems, that would be the one thing that most strikes fear in the heart of everyone who is learning how to do algebra. You think, I don't have a clue what in the world I'm supposed to do with these word problems. So we're going to talk about just a few things that you can do that will make it easier to analyze what you're doing. So if you're using the same text that I am, this is what your book looks like. It's Algebra 1 for Christian Schools, published by Bob Jones University Press, and I'm using the second edition. The third edition has a totally different order to it. You can still gain some knowledge from watching this video, however. So let's go ahead and pray, and I've got a joke for you, and we'll dive right into this material. Father, I thank you that you have given to man the ability to reason and to think and to learn and to apply the knowledge that we learn. Father, I hope that you would help us to be attentive, that you would cause us to uh, be able to understand the material that's presented today and to be able to apply it not only in this class, but in our lives. I thank you for your involvement in our lives and that you love us. And I pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Okay, this section, it's section 4.2 on page 136, begins, When a problem arises in your life, how do you solve it? Do you hide your hand and head in the sand and hope the problem will go away? Do you consider it unimportant? Do you worry about it and fret about it? Or do you just plan a solution to the problem and attempt to put it into action? Well, probably all of us at one time or another have hit our hand, head in the sand, figuratively speaking, and just really hoped and prayed that problem would go away. Or we thought, oh, this is not a big deal, I don't have to worry about it. Or we have just fretted ourselves, worried ourselves sick over it. None of those three choices are particularly good things to do. When we have a mature approach to a problem in our, real, in our own real personal lives, that is to pray and say, okay, God, you know, what's going on here and what solution is there to this problem and what process do I need to initiate so that I can effectively solve this problem? And it might sound strange. I mean, I, I ask God to help me with math. I ask God to help me with just everyday problems. But really, the prayer is not so much the biggest thing that you're going to be doing solving algebraic problems. But there is a methodology that will help you. The first thing that you want to do, it ought to be very self-evident, is that you want to read your problems. And you want to read it slowly and carefully, and you really, in particular, want to make certain that you read that problem completely. I cannot tell you how many times I deal with people who sort of stop reading or stop listening halfway through the problem, so they haven't been able to even understand completely what, what is being asked. So you want to read it completely, and you want to look for operational words. What are operational words? Well, what are operations? Operations would be things like multiplication, division, addition, or subtraction, or raising something to a power, taking the square root of something. These would be operational words, so there's going to be, the, your word problem is going to tell you um, Johnny's mother gave him six dollars, he added this to his bank account which had 103, how much money did Johnny have altogether? They're not going to have it necessarily quite that easy, but you have the operational word that indicated addition in that. So you want to read completely, and something that you're going to want to do as you're reading if you're able to make a sketch or draw a picture, maybe you're being asked to determine how many feet of fencing you need to enclose a rectangular garden. Sometimes it's going to help you immensely to 
draw a sketch of a rectangle so you can say, okay, the width is going to be x and the length is going to be x plus 5, which obviously is a problem that I just pulled up out of my head. But make a sketch if you can. And then what do you have to do as you're reading it? You're going to have to assign a variable for what you're looking for. Now, You've read your problem completely, you've looked for the operational words, you've said, is there a sketch here that I can draw? You've said, okay, well, I'm going to have x be the distance, uh, or x is going to be the width of the garden, and then, since I have to have an expression for the length of the garden, I'm going to have that length be in terms of that variable also, which is the width plus 5. Perhaps we had a garden that said, how many feet of fencing do I need for a rectangular garden if the length is five feet larger, longer than the width? In that case, x would be the width of the garden, x plus five, or five feet longer than the width would be the length of the garden. So that's what we're talking about here when we read a word problem. Next thing that you're going to need to do, of course, is plan. Now, they love tables. Sometimes you're going to make a table, and you're going to especially learn in Chapter 4 to do this when you're working about distance problems or coin problems, percentage problems, mixture problems. So you're going to make a table if it's relevant. And what does relevant mean? That means if it makes sense, if it is a relevant, if it is a useful thing to do, you're going to want to make a table, and with rate problems, uh, volume, not volume, rate problems, mixture problems, uh, coin problems, as I said before, those you are definitely going to want to make a table. Now this says, translate word phrases into expressions using the variable. Express each none unknown and other key quantities in terms of the variable. So we're going to translate word phrases into expressions. Translate word phrases into expressions that use the variable. And I just illustrated that by saying, if x is the width of the garden, and the length is 5 feet longer than the width, then x plus 5 is an expression that represents the length of that rectangular garden. Now what do you do? You have to solve an equation. Well, before you can solve an equation, you have to write an equation, don't you? You have to figure out what two quantities are equal. You have to come up with an equation that says find the mathematical verb to translate the sentence into an equation. Use any pictures or tables to help you identify two quantities that are equal. Remember an, e an equation is a balanced seesaw. You have to have something on the left, you have to have something on the right, so you need two quantities that are equal. Now, back to that problem that I've sort of been making up as I go along. We are wanting to find the amount of fencing that we need for a... That won't go in there. The amount of fencing that we need for a rectangular garden. Okay, here's our rectangular garden. And we said that the length was 5 feet longer than the width. And we said x is going to be the width and x plus 5 is going to be the length of that garden. Now, if we added the piece of information in that said the perimeter, actually I said, you know, how much fence are we going to need? I guess what, I'm at, what I want to change this problem to is 
what are the dimensions of the garden if we need, let me see, um, not any good at coming up with an even number for this off the top of my head. So it's not going to be even, even square footage, okay? Six and seven, two, no, seven and two is nine, nine is eighteen. Well, we're just going to say, We're going to say that this is a small garden that has a perimeter of 18 feet. So we want to solve an equation here. We write an equation and we have two quantities that are equal. So if, the, if we have 15, if we have 18 feet of fencing that's going to go around this small little fence, this small little garden here, what are the dimensions of it? Well, what is perimeter? Perimeter is the distance that encompasses a figure. It's like an ant walking around the outside of this garden. So, if you remember your perimeter formula, the perimeter is twice the width plus twice the length. So the perimeter is going to be 2x plus 2 times x plus 5. Now this I'm sort of jumping ahead of the gun a little bit, but only by a tiny little bitty hair. If I solve this, I have the perimeter is 2x plus 2x plus 5. And what do we know that the perimeter is? And this, see what I'm doing here? Solve. I've written an equation. I've said that perimeter is twice the width plus twice the length. Then I substituted in the width and the length, but do you see the piece of information I did not substitute? I didn't tell us that the actual perimeter was going to be 18 inches. I'm sorry, 18 feet. If it were 18 inches, that would truly be a tiny little garden, wouldn't it? Now, what do I have? Since I wasn't planning this, let me move over here and I'll be out of the picture for a moment. I have 4x plus 5 is equal to 18, twice the width. Okay. I paused for a moment because I tried to calculate this problem in my head. 2 times x is 2x. 2 times 5 is 10. It's not 5. And I found an error. So I have 4x plus 10 is equal to 18. I'm going to subtract from both sides of the equation. 4x is equal to 8, and I'm going to skip some steps here and say that x is 2 feet and x plus 5 is 7 feet, so this is the width, and 7 feet is the length of the garden. And actually, that would be a that would be smaller than you needed to do, but it might be the width of a, of a little garden bed up against your house. So, we've written an equation. We came up with two quantities that were equal. We had the perimeter in feet, and we had two times the length and two times the width would be two quantities that were equal. And then we solved it, and we said, it's two feet wide and seven feet long. And now they say, let's go ahead and check that. What do the numbers represent? Represents feet. We want to see if we've answered all of the questions in the problem. It was simply asking us what the width and length was. We have width and we have length and we want to know if the re answers are reasonable. First off, are the answers reasonable? And second, do they make sense when you check them? Well, yeah, it's pretty reasonable if the perimeter of a garden is 18 feet. We know we're not going to have a garden that's 50 by 100 feet, don't we? So if we had done our work and we came up with 50 by 100, it would be a totally unrealistic answer and we'd know that we had a problem. But now this is reasonable. Now we can check it. What's the perimeter? And in this case, I'm just going to check it in my head. Width and length. 
Look at this. Width and length, that's half the perimeter, isn't it? 2 plus 7 is 9 feet. 9 feet is half the perimeter, which is 18. If we wanted to show the very regimented written check, this is what you would do. We would take our equation that we wrote for the problem. 18 is equal to twice the width plus twice the length. And when we solved our problem, we came up with 18 is it equal to 2 times 2 plus 2 times 7. 18, is that the same as 4 plus 14? Yes, 18 of course is equal to 18, so we have checked our problem. So what have we done? We read the problem completely, we made a sketch, we assigned a variable. There was no table that we could use here. We translated word phrases into expressions that we used as the variable. Here's the width, and here's the length. The length is five feet longer than the width. We wrote the equation, and we solved it. We came up with two e expressions that were equal, 18 on the one side, and twice the width and twice the length, which represented the perimeter, on the other side. Then we solved it. And we checked. We made sure that we knew that it was 2 feet and 7 feet. We made sure that the answer was reasonable. And that's the approach that you're going to use when you work on your word problems. You're not just going to read this whole great big long thing that has like five sentences in it. And then you go, ah, no way in the world, Miss Betsy, I don't even know what they're talking about. I know you don't. If you try and read the whole thing through, without taking some little notes, without looking for operational words, without making sure you understand what they're asking you, then it just really will be very frustrating to you. So let me get this stuff erased and see what I want to do with this example. And here we're talking about two different numbers. This is example one on page 137. So let's go ahead and work through this one. And I'm going to read it. I'm not going to write it on the board. My class, have your books open. Example one, the sum of five times a number and two times the number is 161. Find the number. So what do we want to do first? We want to read the problem and we want to look for operational words. And we want to come up with a variable that we can use. Okay, it says the sum of, right there we have an operational word, we know it's going to be addition. The sum of five times a number and two times a number is 161. We have times, two times, that means multiplication. And we have is, which is an equal sign. So, we're going, we can now pick a variable. We can say, let x equal, we don't know what the number is, but we know that we've got a number. So we've assigned a variable. We can say, let x equal the number. Or we can say, let n equal the number. Now, what is it talking about? It says... that we have multiplication, we have addition, we have an equal sign. Is there a picture we can draw of adding two numbers together? Or a table? No, not really. So what's our next thing? Next thing that we want to do is plan. And we want to come up with, exp with using the variable that we have here, expressions that we, we, we want to translate word phrases into algebraic expression, like what is five times a number? Well, that would be five times x. And that's five times the number. And that is a truly pitiful looking five. And what else do we have? Two times the number. Well, obviously 2x is two times the number, isn't it? 
So we're planning. We have come up with two algebraic expressions. There's no table that we need to do. There's no picture. But now we need to solve. And in order to solve, we need to come up with an equation. An equation is connected with an equal sign where we have equal quantities or equal representations on either side of that. So what we saw was that the sum of 5 times a number, which is 5x, and 2 times a number. This is a sum of 5 times a number and 2 times a number. We saw that that was equal to 161. So we now have our equation, don't we? Now, what are we going to do next? Well, we want to solve this equation. What do we do first? Well, we're going to have to look and see if we have any like terms. And if we have like terms, what do we do? We have to combine them, don't we? 5x plus 2x. These are like terms, 5x plus 2x. And we now have 7x is equal to 161. So we now have an expression, now have an equation where we want to look at that variable and say, what has happened to that? What operation is being performed on that variable? Well, we have x and we're saying 7 times x. So it's multiplied. What is the inverse operation to multiplication? Of course, it's division, and we're using our fraction bar. And we're going to divide both sides of that equation by 7. And now we're going to simplify. 7 divided by 7 is 1. We have x is equal to 161 divided by 7. 61 divided by 7 is going to be a 2 there, but I put it in the wrong place. 2 times 7 is 14, and then we have 21, so 3 times 7 is 21, and there is no remainder. So we now have x is equal to 23. Are we finished with our problem? Well, let's make sure that we've answered the question. The question says the sum of 5 times a number and 2 times a number is 161. Find the number. There's the number. This is the number that we're looking for. Now, we need to check. How can we check? We can go to our original equation. 5 times 23, and I'm not going to use a different color. 5 times 23 plus 2 times 23, is that equal to 161? 5 times 23, 5 times 20 is 100, 5 times 3 is 15. So you have 115, that's, that does that from when I tried to force the cap on it the wrong way. 115 plus 2 times 23 is 46. Is that equal to 161? 15 and 46 is 161. So we see that we have solved our problem correctly. We read it, we were careful that we had to make sure we understood everything. We assigned an algebraic expression to word phrases. We made sure that we understand we, were in, we had operations of addition and multiplication that we needed to deal with. We simplified the equation down to 7x is equal to 161. And then we solved just for 1x. We are isolating the variable. Checked our solution, and that's what was involved in this word problem. So let's go ahead now and look at one last example that they have for us. This is in your book. This is example number 2, and it's on page 137. Page 137 says, in 14 years, Joe will be 42. How old is Joe now? You have to think about this. In 14 years, Joe will be 42. How old is he now? 17. 
19, 27, 28. He's going to be 28. How old is he now? So we want to read this, and we want to read it carefully and completely for full understanding, looking for some key words that are in here. In 14 years will be... What's that talking about? Is this how old he is now, or is this something that's going to happen in the future? This is a future time, so if Joe is going to be 42, Sometime in the future, 14 years in the future, is he going to be older than 42 or is he going to be younger than 42 now? Yeah, he's going to be younger. And you think, well, duh, of course he is. But believe it or not, things like this trip people up. Uh, an incorrect answer that you're going to get all the time is that Joe is 56 because people will add the 14 and the 42 together, but if you've taken the time to look at this problem for full understanding, you're re realizing you see future tense. Sometime down the road, Joe's going to be 42, which means he ain't nowhere close to 42 yet, based on that 14. So, what are we being asked? We're being asked how old is he right now? We're talking about how old he is in the future. But we want to know how old he is right now. So let's say, let x equal Joe's age now. So we've assigned our variable. Now, what is Joe's age in the future going to be? Well, or what age do we know here? We know an age in 14 years. Then x plus 14 is Joe's age then. Uh, or, or Joe's age in 14 years. Okay? What does our sentence in English say? It says, in 14 years, Joe will be 42. So if we take Joe's age in 14 years and have that be on one side of our seesaw, Joe's age in 14 years is going to be what? It's going to be 42. So we now have our equation set up. We don't know how old Joe is now, but we know that that's what's going to be the variable. So his age right now is x. In 14 years, he's going to be 14 years older than he is now. So x plus 14 is the variable, is the algebraic expression that represents how old Joe is going to be, I mean, how Joe's age for when he is 42. We've added a 14 to that variable, we want to apply the inverse, so we want to subtract a 14. And we have to do that subtraction from both sides of the equation because that's the only way that we're going to keep our equation in balance, isn't it? So what do we have now? x plus 14 minus 14. You have x plus 0 is equal to 14. 42 minus 14 is 28. So x is 28. That is Joe's age now. Have we solved our problem? Yes, they've said, how old is Joe now? Now, is that a reasonable answer? Yeah, because we know it's going to be younger than 42 right now, because they're talking about a, a time that's 14 years in the future. Is this correct? Well, you can simply check it. Is 28 plus 14, is that equal to 42? And yes, it is. So Joe's age right now is 28. And you can see that this was a rather a lengthy video that we did. I was introducing what you do to solve a word problem, 
by creating a word problem on my own. So we did the one about the garden, we did the one about two numbers, or, or about a number, and we've done one now about age. These are going to be very typical, very representative of the types of word problems that you're going to be able to solve now. So take your time on these, understand that you're not going to be able to sit down and do these word problems in a minute each. It's going to take some thought, it's going to take some effort, but I know you can do it. If you get stuck, as always, send me a text or ask me a class, ask me a question in class on Friday, and I'll see you next time.